Yeah, thank you all for um, joining. It's a, it's a panel, we'll cover a bunch of material. Uh, there's a few different topics um, that we want to cover and um, this will become our to-do list. So we'll be talking about a brief intro where I'll cover some of the definitions of disability, assistive technology, accessibility, a bunch of words that you're gonna see and hear throughout the talk. And then we'll hand it over to my colleague, Julie, who will talk about principles and practices of assistive technology, which has been taught every fall since 2011. And then um, Anna and I will talk about the 3008, which is a class that just launched this year um, with the first group of students going to India to work with people who have disabilities to find solutions um, to everyday challenges that they face. And then we'll hear from Jaya, who will talk about MIT's student-run assistive technology hackathon, which I think has run since 2015? 14. 14, all right. Um, and then we have been graced with a student who has been through each and every one of these things. So Promoto <laughs> will wrap it up at the end and share the you know, on-the-ground perspective of being a student who's gone through all of these different subjects. And hopefully we'll have time for Q&A. And then, as Molly said, two doors over, uh, you can come play with some different assistive technology as well as uh, explore your own sensorium, your own collection of senses by inhibiting your hearing or your sight and learning how to use canes or screen readers to access information when you don't have access to one of your senses. So I really try to always talk about Seth Teller who brought principles and practices of assistive technology to MIT in 2011. Um, he was the inspiration for the AT hack, was the inspiration for 3008, and was the one who brought PPAT to MIT. Um, so I always try to remember his legacy, and um, yeah, he was an incredible roboticist with a great big heart. So some definitions. Uh, when we talk about disability, um, you can think of really discrete things like blindness or hearing impairment. Um, but if you think a bit more broadly, then you can think of any type of impairment in a person's uh, body structure or function. Um, or you can define it in terms of activity limitations. So even though somebody might have full structural integrity of their body, Perhaps based on cognitive overload, they can't manage some type of a task such as shopping in a really busy place. Um, or you can think of it as participation restrictions. So these are kind of very broad governmental definitions of a disability. So participation means can somebody fully engage in our society and the activities that we as a culture uh, tend to engage in. So I'm going to try to broaden out the, the definition of disability a little bit more. Um, you can think of not only physical things such as vision or mobility or the structure of the body, but also thinking and learning and communicating. Um, these are things that uh, the faculties of the human being that can be impaired in some way. Um, and these aren't only going to happen to somebody on a permanent basis. So if you think of a, I have a degenerative eye condition, so I have a permanent disability. Uh, there's no prognosis of there going to be an improvement in my vision. Um, this is something that I get to cope with and adapt to. This is not something that's either temporary where I know that it will be resolved at some point if I can afford a surgery or if some, you know, if, if I get access to some technology that could augment me in a way that this doesn't matter. Uh, but other things such as a broken arm are temporarily disabling to some people. So if you break your arm, you only have one arm to function with. Even though that arm will heal for a short period in time, you will be temporarily disabled. And then there's also something situational or contextual disability. So if you're carrying your baby and you're trying to uh, pick up a pot of boiling water, you suddenly want to be really careful because you only have one arm to balance that pot of boiling water. And even though you're not permanently or temporarily disabled as a being, you are contextually disabled because you're having to manage something with great care while trying to do another task. So the, the concept of disability isn't just about those of us who have some type of a permanent structural or uh, biological difference. And um, I, 
I won't, you can read all these and the slides will be up there. This is my, I, I made a faux pas and made a wall of text. But the, the big point is that a disability such as vision impairment isn't just a you have it or you don't have it type of situation. So there's various types of visual impairments. There's people like myself who have lost peripheral vision and have extreme tunnel vision. So I can only see what is directly in front of me. Um, there's other macular degeneration, which happens in elderly people. Commonly is the macula, the center of the retina goes away and then they cannot see what's directly in front of them, but they can still see their periphery. Um, there's also degradation in the acuity of vision. So if things are blurry when you take off your glasses, then you are experiencing acuity deficiency. Or um, if you have some type of a um, neurological condition where you can't process visual inf information, a cortical blindness, then that's a whole other type of blindness that can create different types of effects. So the term blindness or visual impairment is actually is a really huge broad thing and with the broadness of actual effects, there's also a whole other degree of broadness with adaptation. So some people um, have learned to navigate by doing echolocation, by actively sending noise out to hear objects around them. Um, most people are trained to use a white cane to navigate. Some people refuse to use a white cane because they, make, they feel like it makes them uh, stand out in a crowd in a way that they don't want. And so they will navigate with their hands out more often. So there's all sorts of different ways to adapt to a disability. Um, and, and as many people as there are, there's ways to adapt uh, to a disability. So that's an important thing to remember, which is we're talking about a huge space, a huge complicated space, um, when we talk about disability adaptation and the variations of each one of these disabilities. So that's, now we know disability is this huge broad term. Assistive technology is the thing that helps somebody with a disability, permanent, temporary, or contextual, to perform some type of a task. There's really common assistive technology that many of you um, have seen or experienced. There's a wheelchair when you go to the hospital, uh, crutches if you get a leg injury. We don't use the forearm crutches as much, but that's another type of crutch to help people walk if they can't put as much weight on their legs. Um, there's eyeglasses, and I, I know I've talked for already too many minutes, um, so I put a cute dog with glasses, because glasses are this really amazing piece of assistive technology. And then there's um, dogs and white canes to help commonly uh, people who are blind navigate the world. Um, so two dogs in there for the dog lovers. And uh, accessibility, so there's people with disabilities, there's assistive technology to help them do a thing. And then there's this phrase accessibility. Accessibility is how do you interface the world either with the person or with their assistive technology. So um, as a visually impaired person, I may use a screen reader to access information on a website. The screen reader is the software that looks at the actual HTML code and presents some information to me about it. If somebody has done visual layout using a table, then I'm getting this tabular data and trying to interpret it as tabular data rather than interpret it as just laid out data. So this is an example of semantic HTML allowing a screen reader to give somebody access to the actual intended uh, meaning behind the content and the visual layout that's been put on the page. So it's not a tabular set of data, it's actually just visual lay data laid out for people to be able to understand you know, the relation of things together, but it's not actually data data. Um, other things, closed captioning or open captioning or live captioning um, are all types of, you know, accessibility things that help people engage in the world around them, either through their assistive technology or through their own being. Um, curb cuts are a fun one. I won't go on a rant about that because it's a great one. You'll hear it if you get interested in the space. And then bus ramps are another good example of kind of a wheelchair is this amazing piece of assistive technology, but in order to be able to access a bus, you have to have some type of an accessibility infrastructure in place to help somebody use their wheelchair to get onto the bus. Uh, so it won't come up too often, but it's an important concept. Um, there's sometimes tension, and I don't think there needs to be tension between assistive technology and universal design. So universal design, is generally an approach to make a thing that lots of people can use. 
make it so that it's not a special version for a person who has a visual impairment and a different version for people without visual impairments. So this uh, really fancy looking watch is actually totally tactile and I have one, which is why I put it up there. Um, so it's a tactile watch, but it's not branded as a tactile watch and people who are sighted also seem to really enjoy the watch because it has a really cool kind of novel look to it. And so that's something that's designed to be useful to somebody who doesn't have vision as well as kind of aesthetically pleasing to those who do. Um, and other examples are uh, cuteness is something that you can, it appeals to a broad swath of people. So I'm universally designing this to appeal emotionally to people. And uh, the Bop It toy I think is phenomenal because it's this incredible multi-sensory thing where you pull it and it says Wah! and bop it and then you have to like hit it and then it makes a noise and it's this totally immersive multi-sensory thing which is kind of universally designed for anybody to be able to enjoy, for, for more people to be enjoy, able to enjoy. There's definitely impairments that would cause some struggle. Um, and the reason it fits into MIT uh, with all of our extreme future thinking is because assistive technology often pushes the bounds of things such as voice interactions and um, the internet of things and the smart home. I, I had a friend 15 years ago and they had a clock that you could yell across to and it came out of Japan and it was made for blind people to be able to do far field, wake word, and then tell you the time. That same microphone array is what now exists inside of some of these like Google Home and Alexa devices. So a lot of these things that were a bit fringe helping people who couldn't read clocks get voice activation and get information about the clock is now this pro prolific thing that we all uh, know about as an Alexa or Siri or something like this. Um, there's also uh, some, some robotics research. When you start interfacing robots with humans, you have to be extremely careful to respect the interaction and the fragility of the human being. And so it pushes robotics to be way more delicate than many um, other applications of robotics. So it can be a really exciting place to work if you want to worry about delicate robotics that can interface with a human in a safe way. And just two more quick words of definition. So co-design is going to be a theme that you'll hear throughout. Co-design is the process of getting down into the weeds with people who are experiencing what they're experiencing, learning about it. Um, th this is kind of a, a semi-joking, I love this graphic because it's like problematizing. Like find out what's going on, make it into a problem statement, then work on it, and then make it into a solution by what they call solutioning, um, which is kind of a silly play on words. but. It's about if you are trying to help somebody in Haiti deal with a village water shortage, you should go talk to the people in Haiti and find out how you can actually build something that's going to help them based on the infrastructure and the context that they're in. So this co-design process in terms of assistive technology means get down in the weeds, ask some users what's actually going on and what things they would really need. Um, and then my own little tweak on that is to push students to do humanistic co-design, which is to worry about the person first and not problem, not problematize the, the person. So start by getting to know what makes them tick, what things they care about, what are the reasons why they want to go out into the world. Is it so that they can see family or so that they can play sports? Or that, and find that thing that makes you kind of connect as a human with that natural instinct to engage in your community and your society. And then you can start to you know, do the co-design process. But I always try to get the students to spend less time being engineers up front and more time being people. Uh, so that's my own little rant. So that's the, hopefully you all just got a crash course in disability, assistive technology, co-design, accessibility. Um, and now some of the words that you might hear my peers say should make a little more sense. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Julie to talk about uh, PPET. Thanks, Kyle, and thank you all for being here today. Um, so, yeah, as um, Kyle mentioned, PPAT stands for the Principles and Practice of Assistive Technology. This is a class uh, that was taught here at MIT for the first time in uh, 2011. It was really the brainchild of, of Seth Teller. Um, and it's a project based class where we have teams of students, usually four. MIT undergraduates, um, working closely with a person 
with a disability from the local area to develop an assistive technology that will help that individual perform, perform some activity that will help them live more independently. And the picture we have here is one of the PPAT teams from this past fall. Um, we have um, four students and one of their mentors standing in the back. Um, and in the front is Sarah. Sarah is a resident of the Boston Home, and PPAT has partnered with the Boston Home for many years. Um, the Boston Home is a residential facility in Dorchester for adults with uh, multiple sclerosis and other advanced um, neurodegenerative uh, diseases. And um, Sarah lives at the Boston Home and uses a power wheelchair and um, loves plants, really, really loves plants, and loves to water the plants at the Boston Home. And um, the, that, so that was the activity, and Sarah was looking for a way to be able to water the plants um, without overwatering them and without spilling them. And so the project that our students did for her was to create, um, I don't know if you can see the student all the way on the right is holding something. That's a jug that holds water that fits on the back of Sarah's wheelchair. And um, there was a pumping device and a couple of different attachments so um, water could be sprayed on the plants or water could be sort of measured in small quantities and poured into the plants. Um, and so that was um, one of our more successful um, projects from this past year and it was actually written up in the Dorchester Reporter. Um, so you can, you can Google that if you want to find it. You'll see this exact same, same photo which is, is where that appeared. Um, I'll say a little bit more about uh, PPAT projects um, later on, but first I wanted to talk about some of our, our broader philosophy for the class and some of the classroom activities. So the learning goals for PPAT, um, we, we really want um, to help students understand the principles and the complexities of assistive technology design and engineering. Um, in parallel with that, we want students to learn about the challenges and the realities of people with disabilities and become equipped um, with some awareness that will help them serve as advocates in the future, whether that's advocates for individuals or perhaps advocates in, um, in corporate settings. If you know, you're an MIT grad and you're designing a new website and there's options for how to make that <coughs> website more accessible or there's resources available to help with that, just making the, the first step to turning people into those kinds of advocates is just to make them aware that it's even an issue in the first place and what the resources are. Um, and then finally, we want our students to um, gain experience managing a team-based design engineering project and working with a real client. And um, so we in PPAT have traditionally called um, called the people, uh, the individuals that our students work with clients. The term co-designer is becoming more prevalent and I think we're probably on the verge of, of shifting towards that. But um, when I say client or co-designer, I use those terms interchangeably in the, in the PPAC context right now. Um, and and we're, really, we're really very particular when we screen our PPAT projects that there be an individual client. So sometimes, for example, we may have a teacher or an occupational therapist who will approach us with an idea and they'll say, oh, you know, I've heard about PPAT. This project would be the perfect PPAT project. And sometimes we agree, yes, that would be a great project, but we won't do it with the teacher or even the parent as a client. The client has to be the, the individual the teacher or the parent or the caregiver can be involved in the project um, as a, as a, as a co-mentor to the team or as a resource, but we really want to have a single identifiable client because so much of the power of what happens in PPAT is the relationship that the students develop with this individual and what the students learn from working with, with the individual themselves. Um, so, um, as I said, we'll say more about the projects in a minute, but first on, on this slide I want to take a few minutes to tell you about some of the activities that take place in PPAT um, in the classroom. Very early in the semester we have an assistive technology showcase. Um, it is um, somewhat similar to some of the things that you will experience um, at 4 o'clock if you, if you stay two classrooms down. Um, we also have a wheelchair lab where students spend a couple of hours um, riding around the MIT campus and understanding what the campus is like from the perspective of a wheelchair user. Um, we have a couple of panel discussions throughout the semester, one fairly early in the term um, on interacting with persons with disabilities to help students develop some vocabulary and also some comfort level just in um, before they go and have their first interview with their clients, some do's and don'ts, some helpful tips. Uh, we also have a panel later in the semester where we get students with disabilities to come in and talk and that's really eye-opening 
Um, I think MIT students, everybody knows, work incredibly hard. Um, and for our students who are enrolled in PPAT to hear from their peers um, what it's like to deal with the demands of MIT academically while also dealing with um, a disability and how that plays out in the lecture hall, in the dorms, dating, all those kinds of things is, is really very eye-opening for them. We have a guest lecture on the aesthetics of assistive technology. We have a, a colleague who comes from the New School Parsons um, in New York. And I just want to go back really quickly and um, ask you to look at the, uh, the water jug that the person on the, um, the student on the far uh, right is holding. It's been uh, decorated with, I don't know if you can, can see sort of some fake green grass and some colorful flowers. Um, so one of the things that, um, that uh, we try and do in PPAT is help people, help students uh, gain an appreciation for you know, what the assistive technology looks like matters for the reasons that Kyle mentioned in the context of the Bradley watch because it may help it become just a cool thing that is adopted more widely, but also for the individuals with disabilities who are using it. Um, functional is good, but it's also important to, um, to think about making these things um, either more attractive or to fit in. And so um, it was really eye-opening for me personally the first time we had this guest lecture, um, even in the context of like a software product, um, just to think about font and color and what the purpose of the device is and what, what the uh, user's preferences are and everything is, is really very valuable. Um, we have a lecture on um, post PPAT opportunities. So it does happen uh, occasionally that um, one of our project teams will want to continue their PPAT project after the end of the semester. Um, MIT has a very rich ecosystem, starting with sandbox and venture mentoring and all other kinds of things. So we spend some time in class thinking about what your options are um, and what that could potentially look like if you wanted to continue the project beyond the semester. And then finally, we have um, what is one of my favorite guest lectures on adaptive outdoor adventures. And that's the photo that, um, that we have here. This is not a picture of a PPAT class, if anyone was misled into, into thinking that, where it says PPAT classroom activities, and then there's this lovely outdoor photo. But um, um, the, the person sitting down in front is Adam Combs, and he's the co-founder of an organization called Waypoint Adventure, which is here in the Boston area. And they do plan all kinds of outdoor adventures for uh, individuals and groups. Um, classrooms and all, all, they, all kinds of venues, community organizations, um, focused on getting individuals with disabilities um, outdoors and in some cases indoors and having really unique adventures. So this is a picture from one of their hiking trips. Um, if you look closely, you can see that three of the individuals are sitting in uh, what are fairly unusual sort of all-terrain wheelchair type devices. Um, and when Adam comes to give his guest lecture, he walks into the classroom with one of those wheelchairs, which he basically uses as like a, a vehicle to carry everything else he's building with, he's bringing with him. And it's just piled high with adaptive kayak paddles and rock climbing harnesses and uh, canoe seats and just all kinds of things. And he gives a really good, um, he's a great guy. The first time I asked him if he'd give a guest lecture in the class, he said no. And I said, why? And he said, because I can't lecture. And I said, OK, will you come for an hour and tell some stories? And he said, yeah, that I could do. So it's not a guest lecture, but it's a fabulous, uh, fabulous class session. Um, so those are the kinds of things that, that we try to do in PPAT with an interest in um, just getting students familiar with all kinds of topics related to disabilities beyond just their individual projects. In the context of the projects themselves, um, I think it's important to point out that our students come from a variety of technical backgrounds and work with a range of technologies. So we are completely agnostic when it comes to the technology. Some project teams will do um, an app so it is entirely contained on a phone or a, a tablet device. Um, and others will build a physical device, and others will build a device that has some electronics somewhere in between some hardware and some software. So we're completely agnostic when it comes to technology. Students have weekly client meetings. Um, and then in the classroom, we run through all of these topics. I'm not going to um, read them to you, but we have um, different workshops and classroom activities so that we're not just throwing students in um, in cold, we're actually giving them some foundation and structure for all of the phases of the, the project. 
Uh, for example, when we talk about some of the iterative prototyping and rapid prototyping, uh, this is an example of a uh, cell phone holder that a, a team of students made during a workshop. And I, I kid you not, they made, we gave them, um, we gave them foam core, double-sided sticky tape, scissors, Velcro, um, and I think that was about it, and they made this in like 15 minutes. And this one is remarkable because it's a cell phone holder that can hold it either horizontally or vertically, which was not part of the requirement, just something that that team of students came up with and, and decided to do. Um, we also teach them a little bit about um, video, um, video production so that um, they can make video, document, uh, video documentation. There's two kinds of documentation that's due at the end of the semester along with the final uh, prototype that they deliver to the client. There's a video um, and then there's technical documentation and those are available for all past projects on our website and we're going to have a chance to see one of those videos I think a little bit later in, in this hour. Um, so finally just the logistics of PPAT. It's cross-listed in uh, EECS and mechanical engineering and in HST. It's an undergraduate class we offer it every fall, it's uh, 12 units, and this is our external facing website, ppat.mit.edu. If you go there up at the top and click on past projects, you can see the videos and the final project documentation um, for the last couple of years. So um, thank you, and I think we're gonna do questions at the end of the whole thing. So hi, I'm Anna. This January, Kyla and I were lucky enough to take 13 MIT students to India for the humanistic co-design of assistive technology in the developing worlds class. We, of course, went to the Taj Mahal. Um, but our class really began when we went to IIT Delhi Assistive Tech Lab. And there, they create amazing pieces of assistive technology with and for individuals with disabilities. They introduced us to the Indian Spinal Injury Center where we got to interact with some clients there and also talk with um, occupational therapists, physical therapists, and doctors who are in charge of rehabilitation. With the information that our students gained from these two experiences, they ended up creating collaborative teams with students at IIT Delhi and started to prototype different pieces of assistive technology or make project plans to prototype assistive technology. The picture that you're seeing here is a piece of assistive technology that has been created to have alternative grips for cane use so that the torque on the arm is reduced. Here's another lovely prototype of a balancing board to help with rehabilitation. Um, then we went to my favorite part of the class, which was Project Prakash. Project Prakash is ran by Professor Pawan Sinha, and they take um, curably blind children, give them cataracts surgery so that they can see again, and then they study the development of that site. At this stage of our class, we were able to interact with the students during various stages of this process their parents and talk to some of the clinicians and researchers that worked with the children. Here are some of the kids, <laughs> very cute. Um, this is right after some of them had received surgery. Here are two other of our adorable Prakash kids and Pramoda, who is down there right now. You'll see Pramoda's face later. <laughs> um, more of Project Prakash because MIT India was so kind to help set this up for us. We had so many fun cultural experiences within India, including some home visits and a tour of Old Delhi. While the students were in Old Delhi, let me go up, they were also able to view this part of the city with the eyes of what it might be like to have an impairment and attempt to navigate as well as shop or perform any other type of task within this type of city structure. And this was um, repeated through most of our tours. Eventually, we made our way to the beautiful city of Chennai, there's Kyle, um, where we did an assistive technology workshop with undergraduate students in India. 
Um, this is a picture of the Exploratorium, something that if you guys end up sticking around, you too can experience. So people are, we have um, our students led different groups through the use of assistive technology. As you can see, people were using canes, they were using wheelchairs, there's a group that's using screen readers, and um, they also got to stimulate what it might be like to have dexterity issues by using mittens. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is, I, I've read some good literature on the dangers of doing this type of simulation, so I always try to add a disclaimer, which is, if you want to do these activities, feel free to get in touch with me and I can help to give you some ways to talk about the logistical complications that you can experience by doing a simulation um, and how to help people understand that the adaptations and the expertise of using assistive technology is something that you can't simulate within a really short time. So we don't want people to think that just because they picked up a cane and they couldn't navigate that it must be difficult to navigate with a cane because after years of using a cane, I can do it much better than when I first picked it up. So that's always an important disclaimer if you have anybody or see anybody doing these type of disability simulations to help them understand what you can and cannot simulate. Um, you can give people a little taste of their own ability to adapt inside of the context of an altered state, um, but you can't give a full simulation of somebody who has a disability. That is an excellent point. Um, in Chennai, we formed groups with undergraduate students and each group partnered with um, a co-designer, an individual with a disability, and they went through the process that was so beautifully explained by both Julie and Kyle, where, um, where they got to know the co-designer, they got to get a feel for what their life was like, what their what their challenges were, what their strengths were, but also what their preferences are like and what matters to them. And then once, once that relationship was established, then they started to dive into what challenge this co-designer might want a technological solution towards. And then as the team collaboratively started to create um, ideas of assistive technology. More of our lovely co-designers. Um, students gave presentations in the end of this. We had a lovely time in Chennai, and then we went off to Hyderabad to LV Prasad I Institute, where we, we went through a similar process with individuals with visual impairments. We also, as you will see Promoter again, got to do some home visits where we, where we we took students to, to the homes of children who have various disabilities and watched physical therapists, occupational therapists, and special educators provide free services to these families within their home. It was a very special experience and we feel incredibly grateful that these people were willing to open their homes to us. In the end, some prototypes thankfully did were created. Here are some examples of this. This is a prototype for a tactical graphics display, which is currently part of a Europe, so that we're hoping to, to flesh out some of these projects in the coming months and then bring some of them back to India next January to have them tested with individuals with disabilities to see if we're hitting the mark or not. And then more than likely, we'll learn that we're probably not and we'll bring them back here and then do some tinkering and then hopefully bring them back the following January. And that's me. Hi, uh, my name is Jaya, and I'm going to tell you a bit about AT Hack, which is an annual assistive technologies hackathon that happens here at MIT. Um, uh, the AT Hack 2019 team is up here, and I just wanted to acknowledge them because. It's a huge team effort, and all of these people did an incredible amount of work to make this year's event happen. So the, our mission with AT Hack is broadly to help make the world more accessible to everyone, but our focus is really on building connections within our community and fostering collaboration 
between community members and people living with disabilities and students. And we want to inspire and introduce students to the fun and exciting world of assistive technology design with the end goal of hoping that they'll choose to continue to work in the AT space in the future. Um, so this is essentially an alternative phrasing of what I told you. Um, one of the things I'll point out here is that you'll notice that it doesn't say in our program goals that we are trying to build things. And this is an implicit goal. It is purposefully not an explicit goal. We try to be very upfront with co-designers and students of what the expectations and scope of the program is. And our real mission here is to inspire students to work in the field of assistive technology to build connections within the community. And we hope that these projects are successful. And behind the scenes, we do our best to make that possible. But we also try to be clear in our communication to everyone that because it's a hackathon and a short time scale, that won't always be the case. And frequently is not. Um, though recently, we've had a lot of very successful projects. I think of the 16 projects in AT Hack 2019, Oh, about 70% of them were ready to be used by the co-designer at the end of the night. And you'll see some awesome examples of that work shortly. So a bit about the scope of the program. So AT Hack began in 2014. Aishwarya, who you saw on the first page, and myself, actually founded the program while we were juniors at MIT. And luckily, we're doing PhDs, so we're essentially <laughs> never leaving. Um, and have continued the program with the help of a lot of other people since. When we started the program, it was actually with uh, Professor Seth Teller in the first year. And since then, we've grown. And we have done six hackathons. I think we have now had over 400 students participate. And more than 75 community co-designers have engaged in this program as well. And our philosophy is really to emphasize this collaborative process, that a team is a team of students and a co-designer, um, and not even that the students have the technical role and the co-designer is the person that has just proposed the challenge. Some of our co-designers are MIT students. Some of them are developers. All of them have a lot to contribute to the process, both from ideologically in developing the concept, but also technically. And we really want to encourage people to look at it like they are one team and they're working together to better understand how to create a technology that meets a specific need. And in the realm of assistive technologies, co-designers have a particularly unique experiences and knowledge that the students should tap into and engage with. So our focus is really on small scale projects. So a lot of the devices people use, screen readers and canes, obviously things that can be bought and sold in stores and mass manufactured are wonderful and that's how you can reach a lot of people. But in the assistive technology space, there are often also more very customized individual problems related to hobbies or personal needs that may be applicable to a larger population, but they may not be. And our goal is for really the students to focus on the challenges that they're working through with a single co-designer, um, kind of without really paying attention to if that challenge might be applicable to more people. If it's not, our pro approach is that addressing that one instance of making somebody's power wheelchair extra competitive is just as worthwhile, even if it just reaches one person per our program. So I wanted to give you a sense of what the pro program looks like. We call it a hackathon. Um, we started off that way, and that's how most of our branding has been. But it's really more than that. A hackathon is generally one day, lots of coding, people staying up all night. None of these things apply to us. So the program actually takes place over the course of two weeks. It starts with a meet the co-designers dinner. Um, and this is a chance where the students come together and they just have dinner with the co-designers and get to know them, get an understanding of what projects the co-designers want to work on and get a feel for where they might fit in, who, what skills they have that could be applied to this program and who they want to work with. And we do some co-designer screening before the event. Um, we look for people who have a project that 
is well scoped for something short and who are willing to attend and try to take all the co-designers who have proposed something that's safe for students to work on and is well scoped and who can attend the event. And then between the dinner and the hackathon, students have two weeks. So during this time, they're highly encouraged to go meet with their co-designer, and a lot of them do this. They go visit their houses, their schools, their workplaces, get to know what the challenges are and what the technology they're working on might help to address. And they can order specialized materials from us. Um, teams order all sorts of strange materials that definitely would not be lying around a shop from five different types of wiffle balls to cornstarch to wheelchair parts. Um, and we, this is a really important, important part of our process that enables teams to do the work they need, that they've had this time to design and brainstorm and get the specific materials they need to make their project work. Um, and I wanted to show you a video, which I think will give you a first-hand view into the program a little better than just me talking. So this is from AT Hack 2017. It's our job as parents. <coughs> You're giving your your heart, yourself, your everything to have them meet their potential, be the best little person they can be. MIT coming to things like AT Hack and seeking out new assistive technologies. It's part of that picture. It's part of moving them forward. It's also it's exciting. Yeah. Okay. Along with everything. AT Hack is a hackathon where students have the chance to work on a prototype of a technology with a person in the community who needs that technology. So I'm really passionate about technology as an engineer. Also passionate about public service. And I wanted there to be a way to push the gap between those two things. Okay, okay, but I'm not going to make the difference of pain when you get my lines. We need to pick one thing that we ask AT Hack to, to solve. What would be that one thing that would bubble to the top? You know, how much flexibility we have. As a designer, we try to get into the mind of the person who's using our product. Throughout the whole event, even like the weeks leading up to it, we, we and my team kept thinking, if I was Lily, how would I use this? If I was Lily, where would I put my hand? Where would I put my weight? You know, how would I walk? How would I move? Right Our team was trying to be able to modify Walker for Lily that will allow her greater maneuverability so that she can really be a kid. Walk along the grass, be on the beach with her family. Apparently, Lily has fallen a number of times walking on the sidewalk because it wasn't smooth enough. And I'm going to stop this here so I can share with you a few more projects. Um, the full video is available online, so if you're interested, you can check it out and see more of what happened during the day. Um, this was a wonderful project from two years ago. I also wanted to share with you some of the more we recent project from 2019, from this year. Um, so a uh, bit more background, a few things I forgot to mention. Our program is open to both undergraduates and graduate students, and we have a lot of participants from both. We also have some occupational therapists who come from other schools to engage in the program, and the, they work on a variety of interdisciplinary solutions, mechanical, hardware, software, all combinations thereof. Um, so this was one of the winners this year, um, Team Laura. And Laura said that she is an adventurous walker user and that the walkers on the market aren't really designed for people who are quite as adventurous as she is. And so this team worked on adaptations to Laura's walker um, that you can see that she is, was using the day after AT Hack at the MBTA. Um, and part of the adaptations they did was specifically for the MBTA to help navigate the cracks in the system. They modified the number of wheels on the walker. They added braking to both the left and right wheel. And they worked on the ergonomics of the handle. And these are all fairly small. They sound small, um, like small changes. But in terms of making a technology usable, 
for Laura, she said they were huge, and this means that she's going to be able to navigate a lot more places independently. Um, and this is kind of a common thread we see with some of these projects, that the technology really exists to make these solutions better, to make technologies that could be a lot more powerful, but because some of the use cases are so small and not a lot of people are asking for these technologies, people just don't get around to doing them. Um, and this team did a wonderful job at really working with Laura, understanding a number of different things that could make the wheelchair more usable, well, the walker more usable, and implementing them robustly enough for to walk around with immediately. And it was really fun watching them do the testing all day. They'd go out into the snow, walk around with Laura, and come in and show us all these YouTube videos. And uh, they had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun watching them. Alex is a father who recently had a spinal cord injury. And one of the things he outlined was that he missed playing catch with his kids. And so a team of students worked on a fairly simple thing he can use with his wheelchair to play catch with his kids. And I have a longer video, which I won't show you, but it'll be on our website. But this is a video Alex sent us after the hackathon where he is throwing the ball to his son. We're gone. Nice. <laughs> and it was also a lot of fun watching this team throw balls all over the hallways. Um, <laughs> and they did a great job at working with simple materials, but really testing it with Alex over and over again. I think that's what made their process really successful and unique. I think he was there all day. He tried like 15 <coughs> versions of this device. And so by the end of the day, they had come up with something that he could use and he had used over and over again. Um, and the last project I wanted to mention from this year was Team Sarah. So Sarah is a local government employee and one of the things she outlined was that her work hours and where she can go are limited by being able to clean herself after the bathroom. Um, it affects her work, her social relationships, and bidets aren't common in the U.S. And that is the solution to her problem. So this team worked on a portable day bidet that she called the bomb bidet. Mm -hmm. um, and that they called the bomb bidet. There's an extra instructable online. You can find all the details. Um, and it was a great prototype. She was going to try it out the next week at work. And the team is hoping to continue and make their project accessible to more people. And that's one thing as a team we're also looking to do. We added a documentation prize this year, have a lot of great ideas. CAD files, circuit diagrams, that we're working on a platform to get up and shareable with the general public. Thank you very much. OK. Um, I'll switch the video for you. All right, hi everyone. Um, so I'm Promota, and I happen to be a student that went through like all three of the things that everyone here just talked about somehow got like sucked into this world of assistive technology <laughs> um, last semester uh, when I started by taking PPAT that, um, that they both talked about. Um, and it was a really good experience, and I was just going to share a short video of our, like, our, our video from the class, if we have time. Otherwise, it be. Essentially, like Julie mentioned, oh, there we go. <laughs> so, my name is Ashley, and I work here at Harvard University as the Assistive Technology Coordinator. And in this role, I help to assist students, staff, and faculty in making printed books and other printed handouts accessible. And also in this role, I assist with production of uh, accessible websites. So I am classified as legally blind, which means my vision is at best 2200, which means what a normal person with 2020 vision can see 200 feet away. I have to be 20 feet away to maybe have a chance of seeing it. I have binocular vision and I have no depth perception. So my overall project. Um, of 
instantaneous conversion of text signage and other text was the primary goal because walking around in an unfamiliar building such as this, I would have no idea what's here, what's around, um, and a project like this would give me at least some idea of where I am, what's around, and a little bit about my environment. Our solution is a smart glasses system. It uses a Raspberry Pi to connect to Google Vision for character recognition and can race the information through bone conduction headphones to avoid blocking the ears as much as possible. Really, it depends on internet connectivity and an external battery pack, but hopefully that can be fixed in future iterations. The glasses worked pretty well in certain areas and not so well in others, but overall, Ashley had some positive comments regarding the device and design. This project has definitely superseded my own personal expectations. I wasn't expecting to have a, a working prototype as well as it's working given the circumstances. So they must say I would cheat out until I got to the Having something in glasses form, which I had envisioned in the beginning, uh, and having it read as well as it's reading, because something is better than nothing, yeah. uh, has, has definitely uh, has definitely made me think that something like this is possible. It's just been a great experience overall. Okay, um, awesome. Well, we really appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> So that was just um, a video of our project um, from the class. Sorry, it's not going back to the presentation. Um. <laughs> so essentially, uh, I just wanted to use that as a way to show what we did in the class um, and kind of as a summary of like everything that you've heard so far about the process of co-design, how that works, how you're really supposed to be like working with um, the, the, the client or co-designer that you're designing for. Um, and so we spent a lot of time with Ashley. We would go over to Harvard a lot. We would you know, talk to her about what she wanted out of the, the device, like how she wanted it to look. Um, aesthetics was like a, such an important part of it that we didn't even think about, because I think like as computer scientists and electrical engineers, we were like, we want to make something that works really well and really fast and really like, uh, and performance is great and all that stuff. But her ideas were like, you know, I just want something that doesn't look weird and clunky and like is small, but also makes me look normal when I'm walking across the street. And so that's like, we had to start thinking about those kind of things, which you, I don't think you would think about as like a normal engineering student. Um, and that was a really good experience um, just to see like this design process, which I had not been used to before. Um, and I really enjoyed going through that. Um, and then I got to do it again in India over January. Um, and I guess Anna really gave like a good uh, conclusion or a good summary of like all the different projects that were there. But this is just um, a, a few more pictures of things that we were able to. Do. And the interesting thing about this was it was very different from PPAT because PPAT was you know co-designers in Boston, clients in the U.S., and this was in the in India, which is like a completely different location, a different environment, a different context. Um, you have to think about cultural aspects. You have to think about language language barriers, internet connectivity what the roads look like, like what kind of things cross the street there. Uh, like it's, it's really crazy, it's very different. Um, and so it's like an entirely different way of designing assistive technology. Um, and one of my favorite quotes from somebody that we met there was like, oh, if you design for India, you basically design for el everywhere because you're not gonna find problems <laughs> there that you don't find elsewhere. Um, but it was really cool and I mean, I have a personal connection to India so it was also nice to just go. Um, and work there, so that was very interesting. And just really quickly, I also was a part of AT Hack. I know we are almost running out of time, um, and so I was part of Team Susan, where she wanted, she has a visual impairment, and she wanted to be able to um, sit in a classroom and like read, essentially be able to see the board on her computer. And the way she did it currently was using this software that um, takes like a camera and looks at this, looks at the screen and puts it onto her laptop. But it was really bad quality and there wasn't much that she could do with it. So you know, we just kind of um, amped it up a little, made it 
nicer, put in some requests that she wanted. Um, and so that was also nice just to like work with a specific person um, in a shorter time scale, which is like very different from PPAT, which is four months long, or the India trip, which was a month long. So it's kind of like I started big and just went <laughs> shorter and shorter um, time period. But uh, it was a lot of fun, definitely enjoyed it. And I, I, you know, I would recommend everybody to go through one of these processes or just learn more about it. It's, it's a very interesting space. I just wanted to thank Pramoda Karnati, Dr. Kyle King, Dr. Julie Greenberg, Anna Musser, and Jaya Narain for this incredibly educational and inspiring event. Thank you so much. What would be a, a good reason for a student to come to your lab? Um, so students sometimes come to us when they're referred by Student Disability Services, um, but they can come find us whether they're referred to us or not. They don't need a specific referral. They might be having difficulties with um, comprehension when they're reading. They might have a concussion that they're recovering from. They might be visually impaired or have a learning disability. Um, they might have a temporary injury, a broken arm, um, and they need to get their work done, so they need voice recognition. So usually um, it can be anything from a, um, you know, a more ongoing issue to a temporary issue. So it sounds like there's some coordination that would happen between medical as well as academic services that some of these uh, disabilities may sort of um, comprise several different areas. Is that, is that true? That's true. Some students, you know, depending on whether they need to be seeing a doctor currently, um, student disability services might coordinate some of that, with, you know, talking to the doctors to figure out what the student needs and then making recommendations that they come and try out the technologies that we have. So. I'm wondering too if there's a way that um, the lab can help students actually get out in front of repetitive stress injuries and is this something where students can come by and try different kinds of devices um, in order to prevent some of the injuries that happen using a computer over and over again. Do you have things like that at the lab? Mm -hmm. We have ergonomic keyboards and mice that anyone can borrow, so students, staff, and faculty Faculty um, are all um, eligible to come in and try things out and borrow them for trial periods. Um, so that can be really helpful. And then uh, some students, uh, if they have offices or whatever, like if they're a graduate student, they can also have an ergonomic evaluation of their work setup. For undergrads, I think that's a little more problematic since they may not have a particular office, you know, that can be surveyed. But um, we also, you know, encourage them and make recommendations about um, ergonomic setups and there's some online training that um, students and staff can do to learn about the best way to set up your workspace. It sounds like a device lending library of sorts. Sort of, yeah, it is, it is. Uh, sometimes the loaners go for a little longer than we we're expecting, but which means that they're helping somebody, we hope. Um, and we also um, have other, uh, for people who don't have have um, repetitive stress injury related problems. We also have some software um, like the Kurzweil software on the laptop over there that is available to anybody um, in the MIT community. We have a site license for the campus and that actually will um, do optical character recognition of documents and then it can read out loud and highlight to help uh, with comprehension. Thank you very much, Kathy. Yeah, sure. So this is the software that Kathy mentioned, it's called Kurzweil 3000, and it's designed as a text-to-speech software, so basically what it does is it reads the text of the document out loud and highlights as it goes, so it can be really helpful for things like reading comprehension, um, learning disabilities like ADD or dyslexia, or um, even sometimes if somebody's suffering from a concussion and they're just having trouble retaining what's on the page. So I'll just show you briefly what it looks like. It's a little loud in here, but you'll get there. 
that suddenly became a serious problem. Farmers, meanwhile, were confronted with sharply falling crop prices. Wheat, which sold for over two dollars a bushel in 1919. So as you can see, it's reading the text to me out loud and also highlighting. So if my mind wanders and I can't follow the page, I have an opportunity to get back where I was. And you can ask it to stop at the end of the paragraph if you want to make um, annotations or highlight the text and then export those into a separate document. Um, so it's pretty customizable like that, which is really nice. Um, and as to your first question, what do I do? <laughs> Mostly conducting consultations with students, faculty, and staff, um, trying to figure out where in their workflow they're getting caught up because of a disability, and then making suggestions for technology that can help overcome those problems. One thing I noticed about this um, software is it seems to have a kind of semantic um, understanding of where the commas and the phrases are. It was really almost like an intelligent reader. Is that, <laughs> is that something new? I was really impressed. Yeah, it's come a long way since that sort of robotic voice of the old computers. Um, it's still not a human, of course, so it's not perfect, and some people don't, you know, have very strong preferences for which voices they prefer over others, but it's definitely gotten a lot better. Is this software free to a student, or is there a certain cost, or how does one ac actually get hold of this software? Yeah, we actually have a site license for it, so anybody at MIT is, a, is able to download it. Um, it's on the ISNT software grid, so where you would go to download Microsoft Office or Adobe Suite or things like that, you can find it. Um, you can also get in touch with us if anybody had difficulty by just emailing attic at mit.edu, that's A-T-I-C. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Feel free to pick up any pair of gloves yeah. that you like. Yep, just put them on. And what you're doing right now is we're having you simulate what it might be like to initially have a dexterity impairment. So you're not going to have the same functionality in your fingers that you did a moment ago when you weren't wearing a glove. And I'm just going to ask you to perform a couple of tasks. The first task I'm going to ask you to perform is to try to turn this knob. How easy or difficult was that? It's pretty easy. Yeah, and one of the reasons why we are including this is because it's important to note that just because somebody has an impairment, that does not mean that every task is challenging. There are still a multitude of tasks that people with impairments can do without thought, just like you do every day. Um, but some tasks can become a little more challenging depending on how they are set up. So the next thing I am going to have you do is I am going to have you try to button one of these buttons together. <laughs> oh, wow. This is not going to be easy in terms of this piano. I don't know how much work this is. It's great. I love it. It was just good. Do you cook your lunch? I've gone to them. I haven't been to many lately, but I go off and on, It's it's getting there. I mean, you can yeah. see the button there. Right. But it definitely takes time. I'm not sure I'm be able to do that. Okay, you can stop at any time. That's fine. And one of the things that I will say, as Kyle mentioned before in the talk, that if you had this impairment for a considerable amount of time and you practiced this for a long time, more than likely you would improve on this task. But I would also like you to attempt to button these buttons now. So, just any button on the, any two buttons on this shirt. So it turns out that, um, are there a whole seat? Nope. Good. Good. So, so things like that are really helpful. So you just add, put this side to this side. Oh. Oh, I see. Wow. Yeah. 
So let me ask, com when you compare the shirt that uses magnets to the shirt that uses traditional buttons, which of these tasks did you find easier? <laughs> the one with magnets. And the, re the reason that we include this is to show that the act of dressing may or may not be particularly challenging for an individual. It might just be the manner in which this activity is set up. So you can create a way to, to incorporate the same aesthetics as buttons while making it more accessible. Not only is this probably quicker for somebody who has um, mobility challenges with their fingers, for me, as somebody who has full mobility in my fingers, it's still quicker for me to use the magnetized version of the shirt than it is for me to button every single one of these. And if you look at these shirts alongside each other, would you assume just by looking at this shirt that these are magnets and these are buttons? No, and one of the reasons that is is that perhaps people would not want to wear specialized shirts that scream that they're using magnets that are different. So what, what the people who've created this shirt have done is they're giving the shirt the same classical aesthetic while making it easier to use.